welcome to another video from the Aspiring Medics. If you're new here, my name is Irisma and I'm now a third year medical student at King's College London. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through the quantitative reasoning section of the UCAT and we're going to be walking you through all the different types of questions that you might come across and we're going to be giving you tips and tricks to do all of these questions as quickly and as efficiently as possible. But before we begin the video, make sure to check out our channel because we post weekly videos to help you ace your med school application so make sure to like share and subscribe if you think this video will be useful without further ado let's get into today's video so firstly let's get a quick overview of the quantitative reasoning section this section assesses your ability to use numerical skills to solve problems it is 25 minutes long and you have to answer 36 questions. The kinds of skills that this section tests you on is firstly, it assesses if you are familiar with GCSE level math. So although medicine isn't very math heavy, a familiarity with GCSE level math is very important. Secondly, it assesses your ability to utilize and analyze data. That is a big part of medicine. And lastly, it assesses your problem solving skills. Now I've mentioned this in previous videos as well. The quantitative reasoning section isn't very number heavy in the sense that you are given a calculator. So the numbers aren't the hard bit. What is hard is the problem solving aspect of it. So even though it's a number section and it's a quantitative reasoning section, it assesses your ability to solve problems. It assesses your ability to extract the correct data from graphs, from tables, and then the actual calculation bit is easy because you have a calculator and a drawing board with you. Next, let's look at the different types of questions. So firstly, you have percentages, so percentage changes, reversals of percentages, equivalence to fractions and decimals and so on. We also have proportion and ratio questions, so that's direct and inverse proportions. We then have rates, so flow, speed, distance, time, triangles and so on. And then we have averages, which is mean, modes, medians, and ranges. So these are the general types of questions that you may encounter. Obviously, this is not an official list. This is just the best way that we could segregate all the different question types. So let's look at the first type of question, which is percentages. So you see percentage changes, reversal of percentages, equivalence to fractions and decimals, and so on. So here is our first question. This table shows the total tax paid in dollars on annual taxable income. For example, a person with an annual taxable income of 60,000, that falls somewhere in this category, will pay the 4,990 plus 25 percent of the remaining amount so 60,000 minus 36,250 um so that's how you do your calculation they've told you exactly how to do it and then they tell you that bill has an annual taxable income of 28,950 which falls in this bracket to the nearest dollar the income tax he has to pay is and these are your five options so how are we going to solve it we look at this bracket. We said that 28,950 falls in this bracket. So the first thing that you do is that Bill pays $895 on his first $8,950 um, that he's earned. And then the remaining taxable income is 28,950 minus 8,950, which is 20,000. And we calculate 15% of that. All of these calculations can easily be done on your calculator. And 15% of that is $3,000. So in total, Bill has to pay $3,000 plus 895, which gives you 3,895 which is option B. Let's look at another question. So this table shows the percentage of nickel in two coins. And if both coins are made of only nickel and copper, what is the difference between the weight of copper present in coin B and the weight of copper present in coin A? And these are your options. So again, how are we going to solve this? We have coin A and we know it weighs 6.5 grams and 25% of this is nickel. And we know that the only other material in this coin is copper. So how are we going to solve it? The percentage of copper in coin A has to be 75% and 75% of 6.5 is 4.875 grams. And then let's move on to coin B. So the percentage of copper in coin B is 100 minus 16, which is 84% and 84% of 5 grams is 4.2 grams. And then when we subtract the two, we get 0 0.675 grams, 
which is option D. So again, all these calculations are quite easy to do on the calculator and shouldn't take you too long. One of my biggest tips is to familiarize yourself with the UCAT calculator early on because although you are given a calculator, this calculator is quite hard to use and is quite basic. So familiarizing yourself with the calculator and practicing with it will definitely help save you some time in the exam. Moving on to the next type of question, which is proportion and ratio. So that's direct and inverse proportions. So let's look at the first question. Mineral water is classified on the basis of amount of dissolved solid mineral it contains. And this chart shows the codes for different levels of total dissolved solids and the number of mineral water bottles for each code that are sold at this store. So we have TDS1, which is less than 50, TDS2 is 50 to 500, TDS3 is 500 to 1,500, and TDS4 is more than 1,500. And then they've also given the number of bottles in each of these categories. Now the question is, what fraction of the total number of bottles sold at the store with TDS greater than or equal to 50 have the code TDS4? So firstly, what TDS categories have um, a mineral content of more than 50 milligrams per litre? That's TDS 2, 3 and 4 and we need to find the fraction of TDS4 bottles in this entire group. So we're going to add up all of these numbers 83 37 and 30 which gives us 150 and then let's look at the number of bottles with the code tds4 which is 30 and our fraction is 30 over 150 which is 1 over 5 which is option b now let's look at another question in this category this table shows the viewership of five primetime programs on a weekday it's really important to go through all the information in the question so this is the program this is the base audience population the number of audience tuned in through network and cable and then they've given us ratings which is a bit strange because the question asks us what is the total number of audience who tune into program three and then you read this extra bit here that says that from the rating you can figure out the number of audience that has tuned in. So it's really important to read absolutely everything in the question, including this tiny little formula that they've given at the bottom. So how are we gonna solve this question? Well, first things first, it's really easy. Just add up 567 and 594. We know those are the number of people who have tuned in through network and cable, and then we have two ratings. And from the ratings, we need to figure out how many people tuned in. So we use this little formula, and from this formula, you basically need to make the number of audience who tuned in the subject of the formula, which means the number of audience that tuned in is equal to the rating times the audience population, which we have here, divided by 100. And you can see both of those calculations here. And that gives us a total of 1,728, which is option D. So again, these calculations can be quite hard to do, but because you have a calculator, you save lots of time on that. The thing. The key thing that this question tested you on was whether or not you read the entire question and whether or not you had a good understanding of what the question was asking you, which is assessing your problem solving skills. Now, moving on to the next type of question, which is rates. So flow, speed and distance time triangles. Let's look at the first question, which is that this graph shows the velocity of two cars at different times. So this is car A over four seconds, and this is car B over four seconds. And they've also given you the formula for acceleration, which is change in velocity over change in time. And we need to figure out how much greater is the acceleration of car A than the acceleration of car B. So how do we find out the acceleration of car A? It's 16 which is the change in velocity over the change in time, which is four, which gives you four meter per second square. And for car B, even without calculating anything, you can see that there is no change in velocity because it's a horizontal line. And so the change in velocity is zero over four, which is obviously zero. So the difference in acceleration is four meter per second square, which is A. Let's look at the second question. This is a bit trickier. So helium balloons are used for weather research and below is information about how the temperature of the atmosphere changes with height and how fast balloons ascend. So dry air temperature decreases by 5.2 degrees Celsius every 500 meters that you go up. So if you go up 500 meters, the dry air temperature will decrease by 5.2 degrees Celsius. Whereas with wet air temperature, every 500 meters, the temperature changes or decreases by 2.8 degrees Celsius. And the rate of climb of a balloon is 4.8 meters per second. And they've given you some conversion factors as well. 
So when the ground temperature is 24 degrees Celsius, what is the temperature, correct to one decimal place, in dry air at a height of 1.8 kilometers? So how do we solve that? So we're going 1.8 kilometers above sea level. And we know that every 500 meters, the temperature decreases by 5.2 degrees Celsius if we're looking at dry air temperature. So if we do all of that calculation, you'll see that the temperature decreases by 18.72 degrees Celsius. And we know that the ground temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. So 24 minus 18.72 is our answer, which is 5.28. However, they've also said that you need to correct this answer to one decimal place. And therefore, the answer is 5.3, which is option A. Moving on to the last question type, which is averages. So that's mean, mode, median and ranges. So let's look at the first question, which is about tuberculosis, mortality and the mortality rate on an island called Opel Island. So they've given you the years, the number of deaths per year and the mortality rate. They've then told you that the population of this island in 2017 was 51 million something. And they've told you what did they mean by mortality rate? It's the mean number of deaths per 100,000 of the population. And they have said the mean annual number of deaths from uh, tuberculosis between 2011 and 2020 was, and you need to figure it out. This is quite a straightforward question because to find the mean number of deaths, you just need to add up all the deaths from 2011 to 2020 and then divide it by 10 because it's been 10 years. And the answer that you get is 397.1, which is option D. Now let's look at the next question. So it's the same table, but now the question says between 2015 and 2020, the population of the island changed by, and they've given you lots of numbers. Now, this is a much, much trickier question because you don't know what the population is in 2015 or in 2020. But this is why I kept saying that it's really important to read all parts of the question because if you look at the bottom here, the mortality rate is the mean number of deaths per 100,000 of the population. So if we have the mortality rate and if we have the number of deaths, we could find out what the population was that year. So we're going to use that. This is what I've been talking about. Now, if the mortality rate is the number of deaths, per 100,000 of the population. So that's number of deaths times 100,000 divided by the population. We can rearrange this formula to figure out what population is. And as I've done that here, population will be equal to number of deaths times 100,000 divided by mortality rate. Using that formula, let's try to solve the question. So the population in 2015 will be equal to the number of deaths, 393 times 100,000 divided by the mortality rate, which is 0 0.76. And this is the answer that you get after using your calculator to figure that out. And we do the same thing in 2020. So deaths 393 times 100,000 divided by the mortality rate, which is 0 0.74. And this is the number that we get. And then you subtract the two to find the difference in population. And you see that it is 1,397,582. And we can see that the population is more in 2020 than in 2015. So that's why the answer is positive and therefore the answer is E. So before we end, I just want to give you some top tips of ours that will help you ace the quantitative reasoning section. So first off, as I've been saying, use the drawing board and the calculator. Lots of times you'll find question sets. So you will have the same table or the same graph, but five questions relating to it. So it might be a useful idea to note down your previous answers or previous calculations on the drawing board because they may be useful in a few question in that set. Second is to practice your mental math. So as I mentioned before, the calculator is obviously very useful when it comes to big numbers. But as I've also mentioned, it's quite basic and it's quite hard and slow to use. So for smaller calculations, you might actually save time if you use your mental math instead of using and relying on the calculator. So a good balance of using the calculator and practicing your mental math is really important. Third is to learn important formulae, especially acceleration, speed, distance, time, and so on. These are all really important ones that keep popping up. It is really important to learn them up because it's not guaranteed that the UCAT will give you these formulae in the question. Next is make sure to not forget units and conversions. Your final answer should be in the same unit as the question. Um, if it's different, you need to make sure you convert that. Next is to revisit some GCSE math topics. So like I mentioned right at the beginning of this video, 
Uh, the purpose of the quantitative reasoning section, one of the many purposes, is to make sure that you have some familiarity with GCSE level math. And so revising GCSE math topics is kind of the level at which they're going to be assessing you. So um, revising topics like graphs, sets, probability, percentages, and so on will be really useful. And lastly, and our most useful tip is to practice, practice, practice. Um, math is something that only comes with practice and the more you practice the more likely you are to get more questions correct and to do the same questions much much faster and as we know the UCAT is very hard on time so practice will make perfect. Um, if you found today's video useful then make sure to like, share and subscribe and comment down below what video you would like to see next. See you next time!